Hello, my name is Desiree, and today I will be presenting Code Drum Line. Okay, so this is the drum. It's a mini drum. Yeah. This is the wire you plug into your PC and your Bluetooth board. And this is your Bluetooth board. This is your battery for your drum. So, to be able to program this drone, you will need an app called Code Drone. Yeah. And then you, you plug in your Bluetooth board and make sure to press your button. And make sure the light is red. Okay. Okay. So this is what the app looks like when you first log into it. So Desiree, if I remember correctly, when you were showing us at the maker meeting, kind of the difference between this drone and other drones is that this one gets programmed, right? Yes. Versus a remote control car or something, right? How, how are you programming it? By the app called RV Code Drone. What language are you using? Block programming. Snap. Scratch is a version of Snap. Is snap is a version. Of, yeah, the, a lot. What you'll see a lot in these uh, these programming languages is these visual representations. It originally came out of MIT as Scratch, almost over ten years ago now, maybe fifteen, and it's been used heavily and kind of recycled and added on to over time, so that you could control it. It's a very visual environment, so you don't have to deal with typing code. And you think you might think to yourself, this visual stuff isn't really going to be used in the real world. Professional developers are switching over to visual representations because it's just easier. It's faster. When you're dragging and dropping commands, it's a heck of a lot faster than 10, go to, whatever. Yeah. Okay. So right now I just connected to my drone and right now I'm just writing the code so it can go up, fly up and then land. And right now I'm putting how many seconds I want it to fly. I'm going to just put it for six seconds. And I'm going to go to fly open. And how many seconds? I put six seconds. Good. That's short. <laughs> And I put landing. So you're actually writing a program that says do this, do this yes. for a while, and then do something else, right? Yes. Magic. take off and land, but you can tell it to do whatever you want. For example, in the engineer corps, uh, after I got out of the Army, I was teaching at a high school, uh, Army Reserve, uh, engineer topographic unit, how to make maps. This is the juniors and seniors in high school. We had a three-quarter ton with the photo lab, we had a printing press, and we had to teach them all drafting and so on. Now is done with what's called geo-mapping. You take the drone up, you go up in the sky with the drone, you take a picture of, of the lake. Okay. When you get a picture of the lake down here, then you get a computer program that's going to make all the contours for you, which is very important. Any soldier knows going up a hill is pretty tough stuff, especially if the enemy is up there. When you tend to in Korea, you always want to take the high ground, even in cowboy movies. So you must have a good map. And maps go out of date very quick. The aviation industry 
needs good maps. So now you can do mapping a lot quicker. They used to do them in 10, 15, 20 years. I don't know what the, but you can do a map now. Uh, an engineer unit could do a map almost overnight if they have this skill to do it. So what, what do you think, what's particularly interesting about this drone? Why, why would you want to play around with this versus a, a regular remote control drone? Yes, go ahead. Because you wouldn't have to, um, you wouldn't have to touch the, you wouldn't have to use the controller. Sure. And you, all you have to do is type it in on your computer and then press it and then it just does what you want. Sure. Well, it, it's different, but what's interesting from, from my perspective is looking at it is you often see silos between people who are programmers and people who are doing something with a physical object. This crosses both, right? You have to be a programmer, right, Desiree? Yeah. And you have to know how drones work. So it's a really neat crossover. I really am impressed with their uh, mm -hmm. what they've done. She changed the time. Right. Don't, don't set that. So you can see how it has an effect. And it's, it's, it's probably one of the best flying ones we have. I think the co-drone is one of the best flying ones. One thing from my standpoint. Oh! <laughs> you can do a forced landing. <laughs> Emergency landing. When it doesn't land, you can force, force it to land. So one thing that's interesting should be to all of us, in my opinion. <clears throat> the Army is making these for the infantrymen. Okay. Got to have certain specs, got to have flying bad weather, it's got to fly in a certain amount of wind, and so on. But an infantry squad is going to have a drone with the camera. You want to know where that machine gun is up on the hill, right? So now they'll be able to send a drone up and look over the site. Good, high quality video. The problem is, we do not have the technology in the United States to do it. We just let a contract for somebody in Europe to make one drone, handmade, $90,000 per drone for the U.S. infantry. Most people don't think about that, but think about what that means. And he's a toy maker. It's a toy making company near Germany, over in one of those countries. And he's going to get $90,000 to make one. And he's probably going to get a contract for 100 or 200. But we've really got to start getting caught up uh, on this high test. Okay. Orlando? Yeah. The, the water drone. <laughs> <laughs>